Peter Clark, smacked all the internet of things. Thank you so much for coming. Who is a first timer? Oh my god. Well, you didn't know to expect free pizza then, so that's cool. Uh, for the rest of you, I want you to focus not on the fact that the pizza didn't arrive, but all those times this year and last year that the free pizza did arrive. Focus on the positive. Uh, my name is Vaughan Davis, and it's my turn to be host for tonight. If you're new to Social Media Club, you might not know that we all take turns at this stuff. So there's a, a group of 10 to 15 people who run this thing. Uh, there's one now. Uh, You've got what? I've got good news. Share it. Sorry to interrupt. Pizza will be here in about 45 minutes, guys. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. so we're going to we're going to do that. We're not going to stop and eat the pizza. We'll deliver pizza to the end of the rows, and then it's like a reverse church. You take you take a piece out. <laughs> Where was I? I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome up front from Vodafone, and Vodafone are our most awesome and amazing sponsors because look around you. Um, Mr. Scott Pollard, to say a few words, Scott. Thank you. Um, so normally this would be Jerry doing this, but she was called away um, to um, a family emergency, I think, so I had very little notice, so forgive me, I've just got a couple of notes just to make sure that um, I stay on track here in the next couple of minutes. Um, firstly, I'm, uh, as one said, I'm Scott Pollard, so I've got a role which kind of fits in this particular space. I'm the country manager for what we call Machine to Machine, which is, I guess, the plumbing for the uh, for the internet of things as we connect different devices and machines to each other. Um, it's a really growing space for Vodafone, so I'm very, uh, very grateful to be part of this particular event. Um, uh, from a housekeeping perspective, just a couple of things to know. Um, uh, you'll meet our team very quickly if there's some, some smoke that, that breaks out and a fire that breaks out here. Um, but the evacuation area is out the front, so through the front doors that you probably came into. And uh, also the toilets are just off the foyer at the front as well. So, um, yeah, as I said, um, thank you and we're very thrilled to be part of uh, this particular event and hosting it here this evening. Um, the Internet of Things and the topic of why isn't my fridge ordering my milk? thought was particularly interesting to me because I just signed off on a trial with a fridge manufacturer. It's very, getting very close to ordering uh, people's milk, but it's in a commercial capacity. So this fridge has a bunch of sensors in it, and through a portal you can tell where your fridges are in a commercial sense. So there might be a number across a bunch of cities and a bunch of different countries. It tells you what the temperature is inside the fridge and outside the fridge. Uh, it tells you how hard your compressor is working. And it's got weight sensors in the bottom that sort of measures if, if you're starting to get out of stock, getting uh, coming out of stock. So, you know, running out of milk, at least in the corner dairy, could be something that the Internet of Things has a role to play in. Um, so it is really becoming a very interesting space for us around what's what's going on and how business is changing. For that particular fridge manufacturer, you know, you can say that their business model is changing from being a producer of fridges and having a servicing arm to providing cooling as a service, so as a customer you don't have to ever worry if it breaks down or about stock loss because they're constantly monitoring and um, uh, doing maintenance to that fridge to make sure it's ready to go. Um, I think that uh, the other thing which is uh, cool about my role and the role that Vodafone plays here is that um, we manage over 20 million connected devices globally at the moment and that's growing I think at above 20% year on year and if you guys have read the predictions that come out on the Internet of Things and that's, that's growth that's just staggering. In New Zealand here alone we manage over a million mobile connections in the machine to machine space and again that's growing really really fast as well. Um, our global team's got about 1200 people so it's becoming a significant part of our business and our, our big challenge actually is to be more than just the connectivity so we're really interested in the role that Vodafone plays beyond just connecting different devices through mobile or fixed um, connections. So, um, so we see this as a, as a really important evolving space, and, but the best bit about um, my role is finding out how people are using this uh, technology and the application of machine-to-machine -machine devices. So when you get a, a crowd together and you start to talk about machine-to-machine -machine and the Internet of Things, you get some really, really cool stories coming out about what people are doing from anything from killing rats and pest control to um, telling you when a quad bike rolls over in the back of a farming block to uh, having sensors that tell you that your tenants are smoking pee. 
Um, so these are all real life examples of things that are happening here today. And, uh, and the really um, great part is when you get a bunch of people together who are passionate and have got different business problems to solve, you find out what's really going on and then it starts to beg uh, other questions around, well if that's possible, then I could potentially use it for something else. So the world's changing around us and um, uh, I see it happening and it's a very cool part of my role and I'm thrilled to be um, in a group of you people and hear what you've got to say about the space as well. So thanks, Warren. This is where you pack the sponsor. <laughs> and tonight in our entire series would not be possible without our other sponsors, uh, Domino's. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so close to deleting. But, uh, yay, Domino's. Interlight. If you use Instagram and put the hashtag Smackle on your Instagram post, a photograph of your Instagram picture will magically come out of the printer in reception. So, so cool. Pandora is our seasoned music sponsor. You may have heard some tunes happening earlier on, uh, and they've also given us cash contributions for season. Uh, Controlroom.co for the uh, email and website management. Socialites for our social media. Uh, Beaver Tree, who tried that? The new sort of ginger beer stuff. That was pretty awesome. Throw all those out in the foyer. In Vivo, who, if you follow crowdfunding and read our email, uh, launched their private um, crowdfunding equity raise today, and half an hour ago, spent through a million dollars. So that was you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bloggers Club for uh, cash contribution for the season, and Recorderly. Yay, Recorderly. So, who would like to win a thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, if under your chair you have one of these. <laughs> Hold it up. There's one, two, three. Come forward if you have one. Maybe check under the empty chairs too because you should be fine. Okay, come forward please if you have a pink thing. If you have a pink thing, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. Charge HR, it's a combination activity sensor and heart rate monitor, which is kind of cool. So it tells you in real time what your heart rate is, it tells you uh, how many steps you've done, how many floors you've climbed, and week on week it tells you what you're up to. So wake up in the morning, it tells you how well you've slept or whatever else you've done in bed, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and the person who wins this, now bearing in mind, I'm a bit stressed because the pizza has been arrived, and I'm a really nervous person anyway on stage. There's a person who can tell me what my heart rate is most closely. That's badly worded. But I'll, I'll get a witness. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Okay. So, what's my heart rate? 93. Man, what's my heart rate? 15. 15. <laughs> 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 So that makes the closest persons. My, my actual heart rate is 83. So that makes Mr. 75 the closest. You are the winner. These, these were five emails in a row I got. That day, most of my emails were from a door. <laughs> um, which says two things. Firstly, it says, hey, you've got an emailing door, and secondly, it says you have no real friends. Um, these were sent to me from my mother. And this is my mother. My mother is a uh, French home automation sensing system that connects with things like doors, toothbrushes, pot plants, coffee machines, dogs. Uh, backpacks, earrings, and tells me what they're all doing. So I thought there might be a bit of a, a session in that. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a trend. Um, and then I, I asked myself in the preparation for this, what is the internet of things? And the internet told me, it's this. 
a scenario in which objects, animals, or people are provided with unique identifiers and the ability to transfer data over a network without requiring human to human or human to computer interaction. And in a second reference, talking something really interesting, things can refer to a wide variety of devices. And I skipped the boring ones and went straight to this. Electric plans. <laughs> in coastal, I don't know what that means. And the, link was, and, the, and the link was broken, so I've got no idea what that points. But the idea of electric plans in coastal waters. Pardon? It's exactly what the internet is for. It is. It's for electric plans in coastal waters. It, it excites me very, very much. <laughs> um, the internet of things for me is three things. It's, it's cool. Uh, there's a guy from Microsoft called James Whitaker came out last year. Did anyone go to Microsoft Tech Ed and see him talk? Okay. Cool, wasn't it? He? he talked about this, right? He's got, a, he's got a hot tub. This is not his hot tub. He's got a hot tub that's connected to the internet. And I don't mean by a creepy webcam. Um, <laughs> it's got a bunch of sensors in it. And this hot tub knows when it needs new chemicals. So it measures whatever you measure in a, in a hot tub. Not only does it know that, it orders its own chemicals. That's getting pretty cool. Not only does it order its own chemicals, it shops around and gets a good price on chemicals. That's getting cooler. Not only that, over time it works out which chemicals work the best. Because it, you know, it might, you know, the $5 a pound one might not be necessarily the best one. You might want to go for the $7 a pound. So the Internet of Things is cool. The Internet of Things is also creepy. Um, did you see the story last week about Hello Barbie? No. So Hello Barbie is the latest innovation in Barbies, if you're into Barbies, not into Barbies. Um, Hello Barbie talks to you, or talks to your child, gets to know your child, and talks back to your child about things they're into, like the name of their pets, where they live, stuff like that. Hello Barbie does this by sending the entire conversation to Mattel's server somewhere in the cloud, holding the conversations forever, analysing them, and then giving them back. So, the Internet of Things is sometimes creepy. But what the Internet of Things undeniably is, and Scott kind of touched on this, is the third C, it is coming. I have a graph that has axes and all that sort of stuff. The main points taken from this graph is that the green stuff is the Internet of Things. The number of devices connected to the Internet that are not humans or run by humans. So down the bottom we've got the obvious things like personal computers, smartphones, tablets, even cars. And the stuff on the top is, you know, your fridges, your hot tubs, your barbies. So the Internet of Things is absolutely going to explode. How do we make sense of it all? We make sense of it all with an expert panel. Please welcome to the schools, Mr. Roger Dennis. Roger is the founder of Sensing City, which is an initiative to incorporate sensors and a data overlay into the rebuild of Christchurch, from where he has come to join us today. Amber Cray. <laughs> is a senior architect at ANZ and an elected councillor at Internet New Zealand, so she knows all our passwords, both banking and otherwise. <laughs> Uh, outside work, she blogs about this stuff and helps organise geek girl dinners in Wellington. Michael Ranty. <laughs> is General Manager Digital at Fisher and Michael Appliances. So we will address to him very directly the question of why is my French not ordering milk and <laughs> why is it not Lewis or creamery chocolate? There's much more to him, including telcos, banking and journalism. So you're, you're evading the question technique will be excellent you on point tonight. Ron McMahon. Ron is strategy director at Crown Fiber Holdings, which is the company, the organization that sits between the big pot of government money and you getting fast porn via fiber. <laughs> he's much more than that. He's much more than that. He's worked at Telstra, he's worked at internet startups, and he knows all sorts of stuff. First question for whoever wants to answer it first. I will say that you do get a chance to answer to ask your own questions at the end. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up when the hands start going up, basically. If you want to answer your own questions, it's fine, does <laughs> Absolutely. Um, how much of this is just sort of pie in the fire, uh, pie in the sky, weird, fatty stuff like my mother or that guy's um, hot tub? And how much is it real and happening in amongst us? Because that graph had quite a big green chunk for right now, even for 2014. 
whoever wants to lead on. So I'll give you an example. Um, so the CC City, what we're interested in doing is putting a data overlay over the rebuild of the city, which is from scratch in Christchurch. And we see all sorts of applications for sensors that just didn't exist even three or four years ago. So one of the companies we're working with has figured out a way to cram a cat's eye in the middle of the road with sensors. Uh, so it has two sensors. One sensor measures moisture, the other measures temperature. Moisture goes up, temperature goes down, it's icing. So what happens then is a battery pack of solar panels and blue lights and starts flashing. That's interesting because it alerts drivers as to where icy conditions are. It gets much more interesting when it starts transmitting that information. Right? So you can start doing proactive um, uh, gritting and salting in European countries. You can alert um, uh, law enforcement agencies about where potential hazard conditions are. So when you think about how many cat's eyes there are in the world, and where you start to get value out of giving those things a voice, that's where it starts to get and that's where it starts to take off. I think it's, as well, it's, um, look at how many devices are in your house, and think of the ones that are not connected, and just think it, you know, we already have four or five, well, most of us probably have like four or five devices between tablets and PCs and um, smartphones, and yet we're trying to turn everything in our house to digitally connected. And can you move your mic just a little bit closer? Yeah, so picking up on, sorry, I'm for the mic, who doesn't have the mic, ironically. Um, my, so my, my, my fisher and pipe washing machine broke down the other day, and it struck, it struck me in the process of standing over it while I was going beep, 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 and calling a call centre and trying to describe that to them, that this, this, sh this shouldn't be me, it shouldn't be them, it should just be the machine, right? Yeah, no, you did right, I mean, that's... Part of the work that we're doing is we're looking at how we actually take the, the customer lens. Is it on? Is it getting close? Nice and close. close. Yeah. yeah, no, you did right. One of the key things we're looking at from a service point of view is actually proactively managing that for you. Um, and so far, do you know when uh, things aren't quite right with your product? Um, and interpreting that and helping you get a, a resolution to that a lot more easily. You know, the reason the uh, the green uh, bar is already quite large is because you know the things that things that we now call internet the things have been around for a long time. You know, we used to talk about telemetry, for example, at least for those of us in the telco sector, and we used to use that to power our traffic lights and our um, electricity networks and so on, and we still do. And then we started talking about machine to machine and smart metering and so on. So the, the, these things have actually been around for a long time, um, and it's just that internet things to me is a, is a new label for them, and a lot of these things, of course, are now powered over IP. Um, and what's coming at the moment is the consumerization of, of the Internet of Things, which poses a whole range of new challenges. Um, but it is effectively, in technical terms, it's, a, it's continuity from things that have been happening for about 50 years. So it's not actually a new thing. The buzzword is the new thing. And some of the things that have been around for quite a while was like uh, vending machines and security alarms and stuff like that. So it's been around for a while. We just didn't necessarily brought it into the consumer market. And I think so just touching on that, Consumerization of it all. It's also the fact that a lot of forces in the marketplace have actually driven the affordability of this and then a lot more um, you know, cost effective to use uh, and, and implement um, and a lot more sensors being brought into and in using price as well. I mean, certainly in the home, you know, 10 years ago we used to think about a smart home as something you'd pay some consultant $50,000 to have a server in the corner and wire all this stuff in, but now you just go into a shop and you you, know, you buy one of those, one of those, and plug it in, and, and, and away you go. Of course, the price you pay is that all that smart backing is not necessarily <coughs> covered, but it's in a, a data farm in you know Paraguay or California or somewhere. You know, I mean, who, who, who here has um, what you consider to be Internet of Things devices in their homes, other than the computers and you know, phones they use? That's quite a chunk. What, what sort of, I'm, I'm sort of kind of curious. What sort of in, in single word answers have been Without being a cacophony, what sort of things have we got? Lighting. Yeah, that was never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I, heard, I heard lighting, which is kind of an interesting area. So I know Philips has a product where, whereby you can you know, run your lights through, through, a, through a sensor. But the, the price you're paying is you're not just running it through a thing in your house, you're running it via someone else's sensor. And I was thinking about DropCam, which is a, um, uh, a USB or a Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi camera. A Wi-Fi streaming HD camera, and I don't like it because it points out my front door, and I can see on my phone, you know, who's there. <coughs> but Dropcam is owned by Nest, 
And Nest is owned by Google. So Google can actually see when you come knocking on my door if they want to. Is, is the privacy thing uh, you know, is a big concern? Um, so the Nest example is fascinating. So Nest creates these um, well, in thermostats and states which are printed online and Google bought. So now the value equation is kind of weird because you go to Nest and you pay for a Nest device and now a drop cam as well. And effectively, you are paying a fee to have a corporation look into your own private life. And it's not open data, so you can't actually see what's being collected. There is some benefit to you, but you're giving a corporation a telescope into your own home. So they can see when you're home by your um, uh, electricity usage, from when you're heating and cooling your home, they can see if you're home, in all case, in the front door or not. I think there's a whole little um, uh, rat's nest of issues coming through. And to illustrate more, there was a, a hacker conference in Germany a couple of years ago where some guys discovered that interrogating the electricity smart meter could tell you whether you've been <coughs> watching an illegally downloaded movie or a DRM movie. So, unintended consequences. Get out of town. Well, I did it because we know Moving right along. <laughs> you know, a, a, a recent hack that was in the news, Michael, was a, um, and, a, and this, this is one of these stories where you read the headline, and that's good enough for me. Uh, a fridge that turned into a spam bot. You were, I'm sure you paid a lot of attention to that story. Yeah, no, I read that pretty closely. It was interesting that was, um, the fridge made the headline, I think it was only one fridge out of you know, thousands of devices that were actually um, hacked. So yeah, one, one Titanic, thousands of safe related yeah. crossings. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I mean, from our perspective, I mean, security and that trust is critical, particularly when you're in the home space. I mean, in many evil times, they've got moats around castles, right, and there's a reason for that, and you've got to respect that in the sanctum, and uh, it's something that, you know, we're very conscious of, you know, it's a control piece for customers, but it's also making sure that, you know, you're bringing in the right skills within your own organisation to manage that, but you haven't necessarily had to think about that before, you know, hardware manufacturers, all of a sudden, into the software spaces, is scary in many regards. Um, and it's certainly all about, you know, taking the best practice on board. Yeah, I mean, that, that unintended consequence thing is huge. I mean, because, you know, Mattel, for example, is a toy company. And they probably don't think through, as one commentator pointed out, what do they do if they capture some data where a little girl says, my, my dad's beating me up to Barbie, and they have that information. It's, 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 it's well, I was going to say it's a Pandora's box, but that would sound like a, uh, a nod to the sponsor. Um, <laughs> The idea, the idea that you can be, you know, your behaviour can be monitored and you can give away um, information you didn't intend to. And smart meter is a, is a huge example of that. And you know, we all think smart meters are great because it means that the meter reader doesn't knock on the, knock on the door when we're in our pyjamas, but you know, the, the media companies can, can know a lot about us. Is, is there a lot of consumer pushback to these things or is it just really the, the angry people at the fringe? I so um, I'm really concerned about it, especially for the fact that when I drive down my street of all the default password white highs that are still kicking around and the fact that we're going to have all these sensors and devices shipped out with manufactured passwords on that anyone can potentially start to pick up and play around with from your street, especially when it gets to webcams and that type of thing. Well, you, you kind of mentioned that in the earlier discussions that a lot of this technology assumes that it's being sold or distributed to people who are kind of, you know, te technologically literate, but they're not. The analogy is um, uh, flashing clocks on VCRs in the 80s. Right? Pretty simple program, no one did it. And my concern as well is that the user interface and how easy it is to use is going to get there first before the security is in place. And so that, to me, is very concerning. What well, I think you're getting at is that the, the consumer utility of those sorts of services hasn't necessarily been fully improved out yet. Um, you know, if you look, take the example of the, the Wi-Fi for the light bulb. Um, you know, you can turn your lights on when you're not at home, and that's you know as good as having screwed a alarm, alarm in a lot of people's minds. Um, but that box is still going to cost you 60 bucks, and some people would see a 60 buck uh, device to turn on one light bulb as being you know, not a good um, um, expenditure of their money, and that's even before you get to security and privacy implications. You go to a sort of full home automation solution, there are people out there who are putting in the full sort of structured cabling solution for their whole house and paying several grand for it, but they're quite small in number because you know, the utility 
largely due to people. Roger, you... At that price point. Um, at the risk of you diverting into a humorous aside, I'm, I'm getting to that quite quickly. Um, you mentioned the idea of taking control of your own data and taking control of uh, what these organisations can know about you. Tell me a bit more about that. So I think there's a potential for what's been termed information concierge. And I think that's only a few years away before you have software agents that understand which data you're happy to share, which data you're happy to sell, and which data you're happy to um, you know, give away or share with friends and, and how that mechanism would work. Because you know, information about individuals is going to become quite valuable as marketing companies start to understand where the proposition lies for them, as devices start to talk to each other, and as devices start to talk back, like the Google Nest example. So I think there is a, um, a potential for an information concierge type software agent that actually sits and controls, like that mode, for example, does it in an automated fashion with your own personal data. There's clearly some very funny tweets. I should have been part of the brand. So what I want to do, I want to go through a couple of um, last themes before asking you guys in the audience, because it's a huge turnout, this is one of our biggest thank you. Uh, to ask some questions. Firstly, to do with your personal lives, and then secondly, to do with your professional lives. I'll start at that end. Yeah, I'll start at the end. All those have been personal questions. I mean, what's, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty switched on, you're all very, you know, technically dead people, which is why you're on the panel. What's, what's the, the one piece of internet of things, technology, that excites you the most, or that you personally use, or that just, you know, floats your boat? I think the um, turning the coffee on in the morning would be really, really simple. And it's funny, I looked at some uh, consumer tests today, which were done in the States, about what sorts of Internet of Things apps would actually people most engage with. And there's quite a contrast from things that people really, really like. They, they love the, um, the smart light bulb that you can turn on from, um, from, from your work, turn on the heater on your way home, that type of thing. Um, the coffee thing was kind of in the middle for most people, but I think, fantastic, you know, the first thing I did in the morning was go and make a cup of coffee, so I was already made in the oven. Like my boat, but I haven't seen a device that actually does that to my satisfaction just yet. So I guess we'll get there. And right at the bottom of the list, there were things like tell me when the, the diaper is dirty. You've got a really small charm, you don't know that anyway. Um, tell me when the toothbrush is, uh, is, has been used you know, to the extent that it needs to be thrown away. And tell your dentist that. I'm not sure all the dentists, but no, it's not going to be good. Um, so many things like that. But not the numbers. Well, you, you don't even have a Twitter account, which is another um, conversation entirely. <laughs> you called me a rebel, didn't you? You called me a cowboy before, but not a rebel. Um, so, from a personal perspective, for me, it's, it's taking things like the list and making it really easy. You know, booking flights and things like that. I mean, being able to go into an information concierge and, and write a couple of pieces of detail and having back three options, and they've all looked into my calendar days, I've given them access, and they've booked out what looks like the most best option. Then all I have to do is so it's that sort of thing around how does it make it easier for me. From a professional perspective, I mean, we're obviously doing a lot of work in this space, and one of the ones that did interest me was the one that actually can weigh the gas in my LPG barbecue to know when I need to change the bottle. I've had some embarrassing situations, including just before the Cricket World Cup, seeing a match against Australia. Had a few lads around for barbecue at 12 o'clock. That barbecue didn't fire up, so it's a quick rush off to the petrol and a gas station to get it filled. So if I'd known that and I had that weight in there and I could actually, they could tell me that it was empty or near empty, that would make life a lot easier. Emma, how about you? Um, so I've actually done the coffee machine, but I felt far too lazy because I had a machine that would do 10 cups in 6 minutes, so I turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured, you know, if I put a machine to do it in 6 minutes, I might as well just do it myself. Um, However, one of the things that I do love is um, my in-laws bought a Wemo, so Wemo is quite an interesting one, which a lot of... Um, well, everyone's nodding, I've never heard of it, I hate um, all this happens. Explain. <laughs> so, it's basically uh, a way to have, so I can buy a switch, and I have an app, and from home, or anywhere from my app, I can turn on the switch, where it's plugged into it. So that's how I do my coffee machine. Um, that's how I do my electric blanket because I live in Wellington. Um, I, I mean, I do a lot of things by that. So I also have the Wemo cam, so the webcam that's connected up. 
my in-laws actually bought that because they found that um, something was messing up their spare room bed and they actually found out it was their puppy so they could do it so that it would start um, sending images of who was messing up the bed so they aimed the webcam directly at the bed. Um, you know, some of this, I would email them photos to see who was doing it. <laughs> I'm not going to, anyway. Um, and I guess as well through gaming, I've had, um, in, in a lot of gaming, you are pretty much constantly monitored um, and reported on about how many, um, when you do Call of Duty, how many headshots, how many shots you do with certain guns. And so I guess from a gaming perspective, I've always had reporting in that world, and it would be nice to have a lot more of that. In the real world. Yeah. Roger, apart from wiring, wiring all of Christchurch, what happens inside your house? That is a topic that is best to be discussed with me and Vero right now. And as you said, because um, my house is not a big town. If you had a roof and electricity and water and yeah. stuff, what would you play for? Well, I actually am more interested in the industrial internet of things. And um, that is at the place where the internet was about 25 years ago with dial up modems and DOS prompts. And what you'll see is that industrial scale applications will start to come online in unexpected places and they will create tremendous value. So at the moment, GE, for example, has sensors on its turbines, on its planes that um, companies lease or buy off them. Uh, a single, I think it's a trans American flight from, say, New York to LA, each engine generates a terabyte of data. They analyze that in real time and do proactive maintenance on it. Another organization that's part of Sensitive City is a Chinese partner of ours. Uh, they're number two in wind in China. They do wind turbines. Each of their turbines has 150 sensors inside them. That enables them to operate wind farms as a team. So the turbine in front is not blocked from the turbine behind. They have things like LiDAR sitting on the blades. They can anticipate wind flow patterns. Um, that gives them a 15% uplift in operating efficiency. Wind farms are very, very expensive assets to run. 15% is a massive gain. They get another 15% from doing proactive maintenance. They have sensors, for example, that tell them the percentage of iron filings in the gearbox oil. So they can schedule maintenance based on big data analytics. So the industrial internet of things is where you'll start to see use cases emerge where previously there's been nothing. That's going to just, I think, blow the personal IoT out of the water. Yeah, I mean, to, to Scott's point, that the you know the the fridge that's ordering its own milk is in a dairy or a restaurant or whatever it is, that probably explains some of that big chunk of green in that in that earlier graph. I'm going to put the questions to you guys now, so I'll, I'll come down with the microphone. The reason we need a microphone is because we're streaming, so even if you think you have a big loud voice, still use it. Uh, and there are only two rules about questions. Rule one is the question needs to be a question, and actually we don't need another rule. Um, <laughs> who has one? Sure. Um, for Amber and um, Mr. Schumpeil, I've got the name, but... Rhymes. Michael. Rhymes. Yeah. Um, Michael. Michael. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so with regards to the information concierge and the proliferation of different devices like a hot tub uh, and everything sort of being centralised to the bank, when is a bank-based concierge going to come out that's going to enable connection to everything, anything you want, and pay for through your online banking? Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> so I can probably use some um, insight to that. There's a little uh, New Zealand startup called um, MyWave, run by Julie McBride out of Queenstown. Uh, she's an ex, I think, VP, SAP. And she is the closest person I've seen to doing the information concierge that she's doing in New Zealand. And it's linking up bank information with a whole range of interesting insights that are beneficial for the consumer and beneficial for the vendor as well. And there's certainly a massive opportunity in that. A lot of partnerships and, and those ecosystems. A lot of the work we're looking at is, you know, it's, it's less about a single product being connected, it's more about the subsystems and then the ecosystems that that connects into and what value that can generate. And it's, some of the, the, you know, the traditional value chains are starting to get questioned already, and it's interesting about the industrial team. Same thing, um, GE have been looking at that for 15, 20 years, and now it's starting to, to roll into shape. So they've had a lot of time to think about what this looks like, and a lot of time to partner with different businesses to maximise that customer experience. And I think Internet of Things will be on most technology teams' radars. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it is coming. It is supposedly the most overhyped um, 
is a capability that's been coming for ages. So. But there's a really important role for open standards and open systems in all of this because um, you know when a lot of the solutions that are out there today are actually closed systems and they're not going to build up that critical mass of scale um, that's needed to really drive down costs and drive up usage and really make it um, you know find those unusual uh, applications that we know with the internet will just be the things that will drive usage in unexpected ways. So I was reading earlier today that, for example, the um, Tokyo Electric Power Board, um, which is you know one of the biggest utilities in the world. Is just putting 27 million um, sensors onto their network. So every household, every business, multiple devices in each household um, will be on an open standards uh, grid. You think, well, Tokyo, how relevant is that to us? Well, you know, um, Sony invented the Walkman by testing um, the Walkman with trendy young, um, young folk in Tokyo. So that's exactly where this sort of thing could happen. So that, that reminds me of a question of my own before I hand to this fella here. The broadband rollout, which, you know, you're sort of uh, in behind, is that, is that ready? Is that anticipated? Has that got the scale to cope with not just four million of us on our phones, but four hundred million, you know, things? Yeah, yes, it does. Um, easy so question. <laughs> easy answer. Great. That's a, <laughs> just to explain, the fibre network is um, there's multiple fibres being put to. Uh, there's two fibres typically at each premise, but more importantly, you don't need one fibre per device. You know, once you get inside the house. It will generally be wireless, that would be the most effective way to connect these things up. You might do Ethernet cabling if you have a house that looks like Kim.coms or something like that, but most of us don't. Um, so, uh, and you can also use fiber to get to things like um, bus shelters and billboards and um, you know, microcells and picocells that the, tel the telcos get really excited about. So, it's good stuff. So, the, how much of this is being driven by sort of hackers using Raspberry Pi and stuff, and all the, the so called the kind of versus the sort of consumer, or consumer sitting down, do you want your coffee or lights being organised by things? And is, is this a hack there or is it a kind of corporate consumer thing? I think the most interesting things are done from outside the court. So in that area of big picture innovation, you tend to find that stuff to the core tends to stay quite static, whereas stuff on the outside is where innovators start to come. And the form of the cost of sensors in the form of size, but increased functionality means that now school kids can build their own air quality sensors, put them up without any permissions. So publishing data online about stuff which is important to them without waiting for a relay to publish that data. So I think some of the more interesting projects will come from hackers and from artists. Go to the hackers and artists. Question over here. Kerry, you touched on this a little bit, but it's about um, security. So, like, that, that big target hack, um, that lost all those credit card numbers, started with them hacking the AC system, and then it went through and they got to the FPOS and all the rest of it. Um, so, a weak link within the home will be a security issue. What do you think it's going to take to address that in the early stages? Because, as um, Amber said, um, businesses look at UX first, you know, user experience before anything else. And, you know, uh, security for the customer, that's just expense for us. So what do you think has to happen to make that um, go away? <coughs> well, one thing that can really help is uh, actually the, the telco bringing some of these sorts of solutions um, to customers. Um, so, you know, typically we have a different <coughs> expectation of the service we get from that telco than the expectation if we buy some cheap device down at night and plug it in and hope it works and if it breaks, we'll just chuck it out. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I know that the telcos like both are working on some ideas in this space and people internationally are working with you know, home security and home automation type solutions. They do come with a telco price tag, so it's a different, it's a, it's a fee per month rather than, you know, I bought it at my attendant and I'm sure how it works. So it's a different service experience, but it also probably provides a different security. I think as well, um, open standards and principles, etc., will help with that. And um, to your point over there around the hackers and stuff, I think it's also about the open source community, so getting them to play with it and to expand on it because there's a lot of um, security packs and you know updates that can occur from those people that are uh, contributing their time and effort. I've got a question down at the back. And when you ask a question as we go along, we've got time for about five more. Please stand up because our, that was point two, rule two, uh, our video <laughs> streamers and photographers want to keep us smiling faces. G'day. Um, if we refer back to the chart that Vaughan put up, the growth of devices coming, that's an awful lot of um, products and services coming my way as Joe Public. What, um, what advice would you give to me to navigate that, both in the stuff that I should be able to interact with and buy, and also what's going to happen if, if I don't, you know, what's going to happen around me that I'm not aware of? 
you know, in the new world where I don't buy in, but all of a sudden the industrialised internet connects me to all these things without my permission. It seems pretty obvious, but I'm going to speak this. Um, education, so make sure that you're aware about what, because it is coming. Um, I know everyone keeps saying that, but you know, people are putting it in fridges, they're doing deals to connect to Vodafone, is doing it with fridges. Um, so before you buy, it would be good to educate yourself about what, what it's doing, where the data's going, if you can, because I know that there's some places where they won't necessarily tell you. Um, and, and it really, this may put the people out, well, but I really feel like it's the people who are also putting out the sensors and selling it that should be helping to, with that education. Um, they should actually be spending the money to help train and bring customers up to an understanding of what it means to actually buy their product and sign up to their data. It's an interesting issue. I, I, I was making a point before I hand down to the next guy, uh, the next white male. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. We have, a, we have a risk of this becoming just another crevice in the digital divide. You know, that not only do you not get the full experience of being a New Zealand a participant in the New Zealand economy and democracy and show on the internet, you don't get cheap milk unless you've got the fridge that knows where the cheap milk's at. <coughs> just before. Accessibility. Uh, Pardon? Accessibility and having it yeah. available to everyone. Yeah. But I mean, prices are driving down, so this is a good thing, right? It's not the $20,000 system. Over in the corner. Oh, tricky. By Fitbit is loving this. <laughs> Hi. Um, there's been a little bit of talk about with open standards, but what kind of work's going around on that whole standard space and frameworks and protocols so these kind of devices can work with one another as a whole? One would answer would be a lot. Uh, a lot of companies are trying to take consortiums that deal with specific spaces. So in the city space, is four or five initiatives where different corporates are getting together to try and uh, blaze a path and open standards. I think it'll be like a, a BMATS versus VHS argument in the end. And I think it'll be potentially the corporate with um, uh, the biggest horsepower and the most device penetration that'll win. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether it's Google or Samsung in that space. Yeah. I know that Samsung called it out a lot um, about how there's a lack of standards. Um, the only concern that I have is that from an internet perspective they have their own forums and their own standards and guidelines and the telcos have their own. So it's going to be interesting who actually wins that. The other interesting play there is the Mac UI argument. So Apple has a huge market uptake because this stuff is so easy to use, but nothing's open. Um, people buy the stuff because it's easy to use. It's pretty secure, apparently. Uh, but still, I have no idea about you know, the open standards that Apple uses. But you know when you go to an Android phone, for example, to launch for playing through. Or well, the fact that your Siri data is going off somewhere and being analysed already. Yeah. I'll tell you what, mother was not easy to use. I've got a difficult mother. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, maybe it's French. Is that connected? Maybe it's, it's well, French. <laughs> I don't know. But communicating via an email to an email had not just from someone that doesn't speak the same language. That was tricky. Question over here. Yes, please. So we're already seeing a bit of fragmentation with some digital services. You can only get this with that, what have you. What's the reality of, say, only, you know, we need Panasonic to the entire house because it's only going to work with each other if it's on Panasonic. Or a specific service is only on Android. How does that affect you know, like the internet of things that we can't use or whatever we want? Yeah, I think that's a valid question. There are some standards that are sort of pervasive and that stuff, so in the home media space, I think it's a uh, DLNA server, DLNA system. So lots of my just the the chip and the home data chip will communicate quite nicely over that. So that works well, but if you want to put an actual TV, oh my god, stop proceeding, food's dry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, sorry, everybody. Um, but if, you know, if you want to have your uh, Apple TV, you can get Google server. So, uh, <laughs> there are people who work. Yeah, it is work, but you're just being too loud. There are people who mix and match.
There are people who mix and match today, of course, in their home with um, Apple or Google or Apple and Android. Um, and I think you'll find that continues to happen. There'll be some people out there who want the easiest and most seamless experience, and that might be all Apple. Um, it's close. Um, but equally, 10 years ago, it would have been all Microsoft, or 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been all Microsoft. So the, the company that's got a lock in today doesn't necessarily have a lock in tomorrow. Um, my household, I actually prefer to have a combination of both because I don't find I'm uncomfortable with being locked into one provider. And you can find that translates into things too. Um, I was going to say something, but I looked at the speech. Okay, I'm okay, we're distracted. So it needs to be really good questions now. We've only got time for two more. There's one over there, then there's you, and then there's maybe you. One, two, three. Everyone else just listen. Two, swallow. Ask the question. <laughs> Yeah, you talk about open standards and security, but no one's mentioned the blockchain technology, which is from Bitcoin. There's multiple uses other than currency, and uh, Internet, of things is, Internet of Things is a key use. Do any of you have any involvement or experience in developing the blockchain technology for the Internet of Things? It's not in roads, it's not in fridges, it's not in fiber, and it's not in banks. Oh, I'm just going to say encrypting the link is fine, you know, but if you hack the applications, what's the point? Yeah. So security, security is. I think if a seed's coming through, it's ubiquity in terms of industrial use as well as home use, because I sort of started focusing on the home use and the fridge. It's protection of your data either through voluntarily, you know. Uh, adopting some sort of concierge service or something, or, or just being mindful about what you're sharing. And there was another one, but I can't remember what was it. What was it going to be? There was another thing. No, I can't remember. The smell of pizza is, is like some sort of, in, um, a cognitive block. Yeah, it is a cognitive block. In, in the beginning of uh, The Wizard of Oz, there's some poppies that makes everyone forget everything. The pizza, pizza is our equivalent to that. You two had questions over here. Oh, gosh, I'm not appearing. I have the answer for your electric clam. It's with aquaculture and measuring the water quality and, and, and so on. That's aquaculture. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I think the big thing is, for example, I have on my, um, I have a Sony Note 4, and I took a look at the ability to connect our fridge and use it as a remote control, and I have absolutely no interest. You know, I just don't want to bother. But what I think we need to look at and think about is just how it changes productivity levels. So for example, there isn't anyone here from, for example, farming. My God, what farmers are doing now with measuring water quality, measuring the moisture in, in grass and knowing and the feed content, and, and actually progressing dairy farming so beautifully. Or what, what, my gosh, what we can do with medical technology, with sensors and helping people's health and so on. So I think there's two really big issues here. One is increasing business and technology business and medical and, and you know productivity but on the other hand it's when it comes down to the wee little things like opening your door turning on a light webcams that can give away secrets and be hacked by the russians and so on it's two different things so that's not really a question but i think it's important to address the bigger issue so, so this one on twitter called Ed Fungi, and he does a lot of that in wherever and so he puts a lot of raspberry pi sensors on his um Farming water tanks, like he knows when to go and fill them up, what level they're at, etc., and there's a lot of monitoring around his farm. Um, yeah. An agriculture example is um, from an initiative in Tasmania from CST, yes. and so they it's not clams, they're in oysters, so they've actually put a sensor in an oyster that measures uh, the heartbeat of the oyster. What that does is give indication of the stress level and uh, helps them know when to harvest oysters. Um, I've also put sensors into the uh, um, environment where the oysters are uh, harvested. Yes. So by measuring two variables, I think salinity and tidal conditions, that increase productivity of the oyster farm by 25%. And that's an amazing amount. So in terms of the medical, just to touch on it as well, I know that there is, um, they're trying to put the sensors in a pill which you can swallow and <coughs> monitor activity in your stomach. As well as I know Google will looking at contacts, which yes. you can put in, and it measures um, the sugar levels for diabetics, so that they know when to start taking their insulin. Yes. 
Okay, one more question just to reiterate the rules about questions. I've got a big question. And you've got to stand up. Double fault. I've got nothing else for you. Um, last question of the night. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much for coming to Social Media Club. Enjoy the great